Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. We have the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. How are you feeling today? I feel wonderful. Absolutely. Are you? I am blessed, black, and highly favored. I like it. <laughs> well, you have a lot of work to do. I do. <laughs> I do, but I've been looking forward to this. Okay. Well, for people that don't know, what is the job of the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development? Primarily, our mission is to make sure that people, especially underserved communities, get decent housing. It's mm -hmm. just really that simple. Uh, in addition to which, we are the voice of cities across America because we are the people who provide block grant dollars, home dollars, all of the things that help them create an environment in which people can live safely in their own community. So in a nutshell, that's really pretty much it. This is the position that Ben Carson had prior to you, correct? Yes. Okay, so he created the Opportunity Zones mm -hmm. while he was there. What do you think about that? Because I've heard conflicting uh, accounts of whether or not that's beneficial for... I think it has a potential to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it was probably used to its best and highest use. And so as a consequence, people who were the big developers and the people who had the big money got all the money. Mm -hmm. as opposed to making sure that it did what it was intended to do, which was to make sure that people had an opportunity to create uh, jobs and to do development in their communities and not just have people come in with the biggest dollar. It didn't necessarily help black people. It helped people who had money that was able to get some of those tax breaks and opportunities on. So at first, everybody Correct. thought it was just for black people. Oh, black no. people, is, but it was for... Mm -mm. people that get breaks and I didn't think it was great for our people because usually we're, not, we're the ones that don't have the money. It's people well, who could afford to well, You sound like Mr. Invest. Clyburn. That's what Mr. Clyburn felt no, too. You said it in a way that you just said it <laughs> nicer than what I said. It, yeah, but yeah, same thing. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. We did not benefit from the Opportunity Zones in a way that we should have. Very few people did. They didn't create a lot of jobs and we didn't get the resources that we should have. So how do you fix it moving forward or do you abandon it? Oh, I don't think so. I think that we do the assessment that we are now doing to determine how we can make it better. I think that once you have something like that that has the potential to really help our people, then you don't just throw it out. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not the first time. Like there was, They had uh, legislation like that before, right? It just wasn't called Opportunity Zone. Right. It was called Empowerment Zone. Empowerment Zone. close. Mm -hmm. um, but Empowerment Zones were really very different because at the time— Ms. Fudge, I just need you to put the mic a little closer. Sorry. so we can. At the time, we made sure that— um, people in our communities receive those resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you will find black businesses today that will say to you that they became millionaires uh, because of empowerment zones. We've not created any black millionaires from the federal government in a very long time. Mm. And so we have to find a way to increase not just the opportunity, but we have to be intentional about making sure that black people get a piece of the pie. Um, so as we look at what we do at HUD, and we're looking at this now across all of government, we're increasing at least by 50 percent the participation in our purchasing. It's going to be $100 billion over the next five years. And we're making sure that our people get a piece of that pie. And that's what I think all of it should be about. How are we making sure of that? Well, because we have been instructed, directed actually by the, by the president, to, um, to increase our purchasing with small and minority-owned businesses. When you think about how much money we spend as a government, mm -hmm. if, we just, if we just start to include more 8A, more small businesses, more black-owned women businesses, we're going to create an environment in which people can really benefit off the largesse of the government. Because right now, it's not our people getting it. How do we ensure that? How do we ensure that we don't get just looked over and, you know, a lot of times, even with, with, with the president, you, you say stuff now and then when it gets down to it, it's like, oh, well, we just can't get it done at the time, you know, because this is a big thing. And, and a lot of our people are starting to get into real estate. They're starting to buy properties. They're starting to open small businesses. But, you know, like with the Opportunity Zones and a lot of other grants, but if we can't get a loan, we can't get a loan, you know, or right. if we don't know what we're doing or we're having hard times or we're getting hit with taxes. And then when you look at companies like, a, you know, a, a Google or Amazon, you know, and they don't pay taxes. So how do we make sure that our people can catch up? You put people like me in, in charge. <laughs> That's what you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, elections have consequences. Correct. So if you put the right people in place, it will get done. I don't expect the president to make sure that I'm doing my job every day. He has directed us what to do. 
I'm going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to make sure that you have the right players in place to make it, to make it work. That's now, the only way you can guarantee it. I want to ask them about the origin of HUD. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't HUD a response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, uh, HUD became an agency where we passed the Fair Housing Act in, mm-hmm. in 1968. Mm-hmm. It was. It came out of the civil rights movement, mm-hmm. as did all of those great society programs, whether it be education, housing. Uh, all of those came out of great society. Mm-hmm. After the Civil Rights Movement, after the uh, Voting Rights Act was passed, Civil Rights Act, this was the next series of things to say, let's try to right the ship. We have been mistreating mm-hmm. black people and poor people for far too long. Mm-hmm. Let's look at a way to try to make it, to level the playing field. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're right, absolutely right. Okay. Now, this is a really complicated time because of the pandemic, mm-hmm. and it directly affects Obviously, what you do for people when it comes to housing, we've seen so many people having to deal with uh, rents going up and prices of homes going up. So what are some things that can be implemented? And and I want you to also talk about the Build Back Better plan, which we're still struggling to see how we can get any of that passed. Well, look, can I start there? I'm going to start with Build Back Better. Mm-hmm. In the Build Back Better Act, there is currently $150 billion set aside just to do housing. So of that amount, probably about 40 to 50 billion will just go to um, make public housing decent again. You know, we, we have disinvested in communities for far too long. About 20 years ago, HUD's budget was about 7% of the entire federal budget. Today it is 1%. So we have disinvested in, in, in our communities. We have stopped building housing, but in that plan, there's more than 100 million dollars to do down payment assistance. Mm -hmm. There is uh, what we call housing trust money to lower the cost. We are raising the cap on low income housing tax credits. We are working on zoning. We're doing a lot of things to make it easier and less expensive to build, whether it be 3D printing, whether it be Mm -hmm. tiny homes, whatever it is we are doing. And the other thing that we're doing and that we already have been doing is setting aside resources now to build up to 100,000 houses over the next few years by working with state housing finance agencies, by creating home programs that are flexible. Uh, And lastly, I think that it is important, especially for us, as we talk about housing. Um, Just in the last week, we did a a point in time count, which is what we call it, about homelessness. People don't realize that about 40% of the homeless people in this country are black. Mm And that there is a growing number of them who are families with children and senior citizens. And so in the in the um, rescue plan, there is 10 billion dollars to deal with housing just for homeless. So if you take the housing money for the homeless, if you take the resources we're putting in already in the budget and then add on that build back better, we can really make a dent Mm -hmm. in the lack of housing in this country low-income housing and moderate-income housing. There's a lot of other housing. What, what are the steps to, to, you know, handle the homelessness issue? I mean, well, I know, I mean, of course, the, the money is there, but what are the steps to actually get people well, off the street? Different communities are doing it differently. And I, I was in um, California. They're buying up hotels, mm-hmm. basically old motels and hotels. Uh, in D.C., they are creating new communities of housing, building new housing, to get people permanent housing. It's happening differently all over the United States, but we have a program called House America, which is designed to get cities and and county and state governments to commit to us that they're gonna build a certain amount of housing over the next year. So, so far this year, we have 70 partners between mayors and governors who have committed to build a certain number of housing to get homeless people off the street. It is a crisis that no one really talks about in Mm -hmm. this country, but there are Almost 600,000 people that sleep on the streets in this country every night. Yeah, is there a difference between unhoused and homeless? Because I, I think I oh, saw yes, on CNBC are. where it says half a million people are unhoused. And I'm like, it feel like it's got to be way more than that, right? But, it, well, but it's, it's got to be a difference between unhoused and homeless, right? It, yeah, there okay. is a difference. Okay. You know, there's the difference between those people who kind of couch surf or stay here mm-hmm. for a day or stay mm-hmm. here for a day. When we're talking about unsheltered, people who have no shelter, mm-hmm. sleeping on the street, those are two different things. There are some people in shelters. There are some people in other temporary living situations. But unsheltered people are people who literally sleep on the street. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, you know, I would say in the last year and, and a half, I would see I see more and more people being able to buy houses, right? 
uh, thousands of more people, especially black people, able to get their, you know, their, their low interest rates with the loans. And I know there's so many different grants that we've been helping people where it helps them with their down payment. But my question to you is, which is great, my question to you is, right now interest rates are at an all-time low in the last year, right? Mm-hmm. Some people getting interest rates 2.5%, 2.7%. Yep. So now, and you know, it's a seller's market. People are selling houses for a high amount of money. But what happens when that changes, right? Because it has to change. Is it going to change or you're planning for the change? Because interest rates, I heard that they might be shooting up. Those houses that people are buying for 300000 that were really worth 100000 a year ago, what happens to those people? Do they lose them like the, the last mortgage meltdown in, what, 2008? Does that happen to the people again? Because now you give them a house and they're happy for a year, but then when interest rates shoot up and the house is not worth what they think it's worth, what happens then? Then they lose their house again? Then it's kind of recycled? No, because one of the things that we have been doing, especially as a result of the pandemic, is we know people are having difficulty with mortgages. So HUD has already put in place a program that will allow them up to 40 years to pay their mortgage. So it reduces their monthly rate. Mm -hmm. We give them a modification. That's what we really do. We do a refi. Mm -hmm. But we hold it. And we're the ones that say, okay, instead of paying the 600 you're paying, we're going to give you 10 more years on the back end of your mortgage. And so now maybe that's 400 and maybe you can afford that. Right. We're also talking about raising the interest rates, though. Correct. Okay. But see, the interest rates are going to, they're going to go up. There's no question about it. And so I say to people, this is the time to buy if you can. But the bigger problem is not so much the rates. It is the supply. It's just basic um, supply, supply and demand. demand. Mm-hmm. And so since there are so few homes that people can move into that they can afford, there's so much pressure on the market that until we start to build more housing, we're not going to see that stress relieved. Mm. It's it's even it's more important to me. So that's why we're doing things like making sure that black people, especially college educated people, can afford to buy a house because their student loan debt has been such an impediment yeah. mm-hmm. that we have now, for for the most part, we have figured out how we can recalculate it and almost neutralized it. Then the the second biggest issue is down payment. Most people can pay the mortgage. They don't have the down payment. Closing costs, none of that. That's right. So in the president's 2022 budget, there's $100 million for down payment assistance. It's significantly higher in Build Back Better so that we can start to give people the kind of resources to get into the market now if they can afford to get in it. Because the market is going to, I think you're going to see a little stress come off the market because we're putting more housing into the market. But it's going to take some time. Where you think that go- act is ever going to pass? Wait, one second. Back where, where can people get that? You know, because you said uh, where can they apply to get those that help and those benefits so they can put money down? I will make sure I get all of it to you. Okay. Because not only do we have the neutralization of student loans, we've got, um, of course, the down payment assistance. But the other big problem is appraisers. The appraisal process is so unfair. Areas. Appraisal is good in the white areas. Black people, they try to appraise us so That's much less. I, and I'll tell you, this is a true story. I live two doors from an all-white community. Mm-hmm. I live in an all-black community. Mm-hmm. My lot is bigger. My house is bigger. My house is valued at $25,000 less than the house two doors from me. Which yeah. is crazy. Because people think white so, ice is colder. All the time. And so we have to be able to say that we have lost billions as a people solely through the appraisal process. We've got a report coming out from HUD in a few weeks that is going to show very, very clearly and shine a bright light on what has been happening in our communities. The other thing we know is that appraisers are 95 percent white men. Facts. Um, And and you can't get into it unless you can get one of them to help you get into Mm -hmm. it. So So it's buyers from the jump. Exactly right. And so we are we are doing all that we can to be sure that it happens. The president asked me to chair it. The report's going to come out in about three weeks. I think you'll be very pleased with what you see. You know, go ahead. I was going to ask, do you think the Build Back Better Act will ever pass eventually? What do you think well, is going to happen? I think parts happen? of it will. Right. What about housing? Well, I think it will pass. I don't know that it will pass at $150 billion, but mm-hmm. I do believe that we'll get housing money out of it. I really Well, because you got to realize, whether you are on one side or the other, I don't care where you live, you cannot buy a decent house or rent a decent house in this country, no matter where it is. If you are a minimum wage worker, Correct. everybody's dealing with the same situation. Um, it, it, just think about I was I was in Denver where the average, the median sales price of a house is eight hundred thousand dollars. In Seattle, it's a million five. Not just black people can't afford it. White people can't afford it either. Mm-hmm. 
And so we now have to matter it. <laughs> to yeah. everybody. Exactly. You know, black people have never fully recovered from the Great Recession, where about 50 percent of black wealth was lost during the housing market bubble. What role do you believe the federal government should play in helping, you know, black families recover? Well, I think the things that we're doing, I think that we are making sure that we can find a way to stabilize the market by making sure that people are educated and don't get caught into those kind of mortgages. Um, we have a lot of control over the pricing, I mean, over the, the, the insurance, over how we support those mortgages. We have a lot of influence over services. So I think it's just a matter of making sure that we do our part. I mean, we can't control the market, but we have some influence. What, what are you doing about that? Like, as Secretary of HUD, like, personally with your influence, what are you doing? Oh, that's why I'm in New... Part of the reason I'm in New York, to meet with some bankers and meet with some other people who we know can influence the market. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, you know, I encourage young black people, young professionals, to buy a two-family house or a three-family house, right? So that way their rent is, is being helped out by the apartment that they're renting out. Sure. A lot of them are, are telling me that now they're having a lot of problems with tenants not paying. And they're saying uh, pretty much the state and the government is really for the tenant. So now that the tenant's not paying, they can't pay their mortgage. And they're having a lot of hard times with that. And tenants know that. So a lot of tenants are not paying because it's kind of like they're just getting through the system. So how do we make sure that we can help the tenants and the landlords? And these are not huge landlords that own 30,000 sure. units. This is just a guy that owns a, a two-family home that's just trying to make ends meet. Right. How do you take care of the tenant without neglecting the homeowner? Mm -hmm. The rescue plan and the COVID package before that put $46 billion into the market for renters. But that money doesn't go to renters. It goes to owners. It goes to landlords. And so what the landlords need to do is make their tenants or help their tenants apply for emergency rental assistance because they get the money. Mm -hmm. That's what the money is for. The problem is, you know, you can't make a tenant do anything because half the time, the tenants, you, tenants won't even answer the door. You can't, but what, like you, but what you can you can't do even get them out. is make sure that you tell them, mm -hmm. this is what is required of you mm -hmm. so that you can stay in this place. Right. They, don't they check and make sure that you actually applied for that assistance? You can. Mm -hmm. And, and you've got to remember now, it's all going to change because most of the forbearance and moratoriums are ending I was going to ask, well, how, they said it would end when the pandemic is over, but we're still in a pandemic, right? A lot of places it hasn't, because right now it's pretty much up to the states and local communities. And so a lot of them are ending it. So I, I would not suggest that you wait until the pandemic is over to pay your rent. That would not be a smart thing. I was going to ask about that. Is there any, any help with that? Because a lot of times I'm, I'm seeing and I'm hearing people talk about that they didn't pay their rent and they're starting to get their, their jobs back. And now a lot of companies are saying, OK, well, you owe $23,000 and has to be paid now. A lot of them are not giving them the option to put it on the back end. Is there any protection for those people? There is. If they would just notify us or get in touch with HUD, if, they're, if, if, we, if we have their mortgage, if we uh, insure their mortgage, we can help them. What about companies like uh, Haven Park Communities who are exploiting low-income renters by using funds from an agency whose original message is to make housing more accessible? How do we stop like the financialization that large private equity landlords like that are doing? Well, if they have any resources from us, we can affect it. Mm -hmm. They just need to let us know. I mean, we can only do what we know to do. Mm -hmm. If people don't tell us what is going on, we never know what it is. So we should snitch on those companies. Absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Without quick, Call the hotline. As they say, quick, fast, and in a hurry. If, if you want to see stay something, there. say something. That's right. <laughs> what about state by state where uh, leadership in certain states aren't using the money that's allocated for housing for what it's supposed to be for? Because like you said, a lot of those are up to the state. They are. If there is a problem in a state, they too, if there are a lot of landlords, see, landlords have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. If the landlords would notify us, we could be helpful. Because what we're doing now is we're taking resources from states that have not used them. So they basically have vouchers. <laughs> we're taking those vouchers back and we are reallocating them to places that have been using them and have been using them effectively. So we can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I was curious with uh, FHA loans or, or HUD loans or any, any loans that you guys back, if people don't put the 20% the down, right, and usually some of those loans are 3.5%, do they have to pay PMI on that? Or is that forgiven? No. See, that's difficult, too. Yeah, you give me a 3.5% loan down and you help me with this, but then I still got to pay right. PMI, which is... That's why we're helping with down payment assistance to try to help that. I'm not a fan of PMI. I know everybody's going to be upset, but I'm not. Me neither. 
Um, <laughs> P- PMI for people that's not listening, if you don't put down 20%, they it's kind of like an insurance to make sure that you pay. But usually if you can't put down the 20%, you're having difficulties and maybe you could pay the mortgage. So PMI is kind of like, why are you going to make me pay PMI when you already know I couldn't put the whole amount down and I'm, you know, it's, it doesn't it's, it's go difficult. to anything but for the bank to have in their pocket. Or your yes, that is correct. But that's is, why if you take the down payment assistance and get equity in the house in the first place, most people who have equity in their homes pay their mortgages. Mm-hmm. They don't run away from their mortgages. Mm-hmm. So if we can give them enough down payment money to have a certain amount of equity in the home, then that just makes it easier for them. So that's one of the reasons we're doing it. Um, but we are looking at PMI. I know my my, my people out there saying, please stop. No, no, no. It's too <laughs> PMI hurts, I think it hurts our people the most because it's that extra Absolutely. amount of money that we can't spend. And, and that's on top of your mortgage that has right. to be paid every month. And, and, it, and it's always been a problem and a headache, you know. And, and, and left, you know, most people they'll wait for a year and then refinance out of it. And hopefully that'll take care of that PMI. But it's that's difficult for people. It's very difficult for people who just just can get in, you Mm -hmm. know, who just barely have the resources to make their monthly payment anyway. It is difficult. Does your department also handle, we've seen a lot of tragedies happen in these buildings that aren't up to code. Mm -hmm. Do you guys handle that or is that a different department? It depends on who owns the building. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the fires in Philadelphia, they were not owned by HUD. There are some vouchers in those buildings and so we're doing what we can to be helpful, but they really are privately owned. But all we can do is make sure that they have the proper inspections, that they are up to code. But it really is on the landlords for the most part. But we try to help make sure we can rehouse people. We make sure that we are not putting people in a position that they are going to be in a dangerous situation. But most of it is privately owned. I thought with HUD they had to check those buildings before the landlord actually gets paid. Like if there was a... Oh, we do inspections. Or for instance, the one in the Bronx where the, the door wouldn't stay closed. I thought a lot of times HUD would not pay that landlord until those stuff was fixed. But the thing is, we don't sometimes know that the door doesn't close. Mm-hmm. Got to snitch. Yeah. Got to set up a hotline. <laughs> HUD needs a hotline number. So. You know, I, I just find that, that people who um, are having difficulties, whatever they may be, uh, tend to not be advocates for themselves. Mm. And if you don't advocate for yourself, then there's nothing that you can expect to gain from it. Well, a lot of times they don't have anybody to call because the person you would call is the landlord. But sometimes the landlord needs policing. So that's why I think people are looking for somebody bigger to reach oh, they out don't to. Know, yeah. Well, but, the, but, but most of these people get their vouchers from HUD, from the public housing authority in that community. Call where you got your voucher. We need a face. I mean, like people see, like, I know, no, 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 absolutely. This is the face for people me. see HUD, but they don't like, what is that mean? You know what I mean? That's me. Mm-hmm. That is why I travel all over the country. No, that's great because I don't. I've never. I haven't seen Ben Carson here. What but, do you say? <laughs> <laughs> what do you? That's great. What do you say to those who ask the federal government to step in and protect you know regular people by regulating what private equity firms or real estate assess management firms do? Like you know, in in that space. I have always believed, and I've, I've been an, an elected official prior to this job for more than 20 years. I have always believed that government's job is to take care of its people. Mm-hmm. That is the only job government has. And so I believe that they should be able to come to us and, and ask us, you know, we've got these bad actors out here. What can you do about it? Mm-hmm. If I can't fix it, I know somebody who can. Couldn't, couldn't the government end certain tax privileges of these firms by, like, investing in housing or make sure there's some kind of, like, rent control? Well, you know, New York is one of the few places that has rent control. Right. One of the very few. Um, but there are things we can do, yes. Mm-hmm. Like we do tax breaks for um, when they have buildings, a certain percentage of those apartments have to be for low-income housing. Right. I know that's something we do in New York. Mm-hmm. And so they get well, it. now they do that a lot of places. Mm-hmm. You know, we call it um, choice neighborhoods. It used to be like Hope Six, if you remember that, where if you build, if you got resources from the federal government to build new housing, a certain percentage of it had to be low or moderate mm-hmm. income. Mm-hmm. I, I think you got that's tax breaks right. and things like that. Yeah. Right. I know course. our mayor, Merrick, um, Eric Adams, he's doing a lot when it comes to housing. That's one of the first things because New York is really tough. The way it's rent really is bad. ridiculous. Buying and owning is ridiculous in New York as it is in right now in Florida. We see that happening, too, as people from the pandemic have been moving to other places. People are moving places for tax breaks, too. And that, the other thing that creates is homelessness. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's it. New York is extraordinarily high, as are most really big cities. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, most low income and people of color live in big cities. Mm -hmm. Not to say that we don't have problems in rural communities. We do. The problem is just so much larger 
in cities like New York. Go, going back to uh, regulating the private equity firms, you said there's stuff y'all can do. What, what can y'all do? One thing is we don't have to do business with them. Okay. They get an awful lot of business from us. Mm-hmm. I think that unless they are determined to look through a lens of equity and to assist us in our mission, that we don't have to do business with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't just always look at who gives us the best deal. We look at it in its totality. So there are many things we can do. Is, is, hen- is ending homelessness an achievable goal in America? Because homelessness is something that really bothers yeah. me, especially when I see military veterans that are homeless. Lots. Like how you go fight for this country and then you come in, you can't even get free room and board. And their numbers are very, very large. As Man. Well. Um, I don't know that we ever end it, but we can certainly put a dent in it. Right. I mean, I don't know that there's any perfect answer, and I don't know that there's any all-encompassing answer, but we can put a dent in it, mm-hmm. and that is my goal. Do you think your predecessor did a good job um, combating homelessness? I'm not sure what he did to combat it, but um, I I'm know what I'm not sure what he doing. did, um, period. But we're working on it. <laughs> We're we going to make it better. I <laughs> promise you we will. How, how has climate change uh, affected the housing market and homelessness in this country? I'm really glad you brought that up because when people hear about climate change, they don't think about black people or poor people. We are more affected by by these storms and things than any other community. That's right. Not only do we live in these these communities near the water or in, in flood zones, That's right. We also live in communities that have super funds and brownfields in our communities. So climate is huge. And and the houses we usually live in or the trailers or whatever aren't can't can't sustain Can I withstand? those hurricanes and things. So like we're talking about sustainable building. That's also a part of Build Back Better. How we build housing that is sustainable through these storms. And it affects poor people and black people more than any other group of people. And insurance can be so expensive if you're Absolutely. in a zone that's yep. a flood, flood zone. zone. That's right. Mm-hmm. Now, I saw, too, uh, according to KTR News, the Department of HUD laid out new guidelines the, the, for the dispersal of $2 billion in disaster relief, mm-hmm. speaking of that, the block grants. So who qualifies for these grants? Well, it's going to ultimately be up to the state. But what we have done is put regulations in place that we have met, well, requirements, I won't call them regulations, requirements in place that they look at it through an equity lens. And that has never been the case before. So let's say, for instance, a city like New Orleans that has mm-hmm. been hit with a number of these storms. Mm-hmm. We would give them the billions of dollars and we basically say, OK, but now they have to come back to us and say, this is our plan to spend these, this money. This is how we know that we are going to get to the communities that have been most affected, where most people are underserved. This is how we're going to get there, because if they don't, we're not going to approve the plan. So that gives us the authority to say, no, you can't give it only to this community that you like. You have to make sure that everybody who was affected gets an opportunity to rebuild. How do y'all check off those boxes, though, to make sure that that money is getting to people? Who well, need? see, because they have to send us back their plan before they can spend it. Gotcha. So they get a plan. They have public hearings, basically, or, you know, have public input. Then they send us a plan. We look at the plan and, and determine whether, in fact, it checks off all the boxes mm-hmm. before we will allow them to spend those resources. Mm-hmm. Now, I was going to ask, you know, how, how does the, the government, you know, that, that phrase, yesterday's price is not today's price, right? You look at the, the cost of lumber, right? Mm-hmm. What it was last week is not what it is this week. It's, it's, it's sky high. You know, same thing with glass, right. same thing right. with sheetrock and nails and all of that. So, you know, when you talk about building more homes, more affordable homes, how could we possibly do it with the cost of supply so high? Like, it's, it's, it's times three, I think, or times four in the last year. But the supplies, I think, are going to start to even themselves out. What happened is when the pandemic started, builders assumed people weren't going to be building. They didn't think that everybody's going to be home and going to be doing stuff to their house, right? So they stopped producing. You're starting to see now that production is coming up. In the Build Back Better plan, the president is trying to give more jobs to people like truck drivers to get those materials off these ports, you know, get them off-boarded, make sure that we can get them to people. And you're starting to see a little bit more that the prices are going down, and they're going to keep going down uh, as long as we can keep these resources in the market. I've met with home builders, the Association of Home Builders. I have met with people who do rentals. We are working to find a way to make sure that the supply, the supply chain gets better. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're going to start to see some of that relieved a little bit as we go through the year. How stressful does this get for you? Just on a personal level. 
This is very personal to me. Mm -hmm. I grew up in these communities we're sitting here talking about. I grew up in a two-family house. My grandmother on one level, my mother on the next. I know these people. They're my family. They're my friends. If I can't make it better, I have no business being here. I am a person that loves all people, but I especially love my people. And so I'm going to do everything I can on my watch. And when I walk away, I want to feel good about it, and I think I will. But, but it's still got to bring a certain amount of stress, right? Because you still got to have self-care. It does. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you got to unplug, have a drink, <laughs> do something, right? You do. But you know what? I'm, I'm surrounded by great people who believe what I believe. Um, I know that we do good work. I also know people people rely on us right. and believe in us. And so I don't have a lot of times when I have down times, but I do have them. See, that's what I wonder. Like, how much of, you, how much of this do y'all take home with y'all? Like, you, All of it. All the time. So it's a 24-7, Oh, there's no question about it. Wow. I mean, they can tell you right now. I'll wake up in the middle of the <laughs> night and say, can we do this? And I write it down. I get to the office. I say, can we do this? And but you know, say, you've yeah. been an elected official for decades, right? Yeah. Mayor and Congress. Yeah. And now this position. And I do want to stress the importance of voting because there's a lot of people who are feeling discouraged, who feel like it doesn't matter who's in office and who feel like, well, it doesn't matter who I vote for. Nothing's getting done anyway. Let me just say to those people who believe that all they have to do is look at what we're doing. All they have to do is look at when Biden came in, checks in pocket. Shots in arms. Look at how we dealt with child tax credit. We still have people, or just up until last month, who were getting two or $300 a month for every child they had. Let's look at the people who say that we can't do better by education. We have, over the last few months, literally erased the debt of almost 700,000 students, those who are permanently disabled, you know, those who went to these, uh, these, these knockoff for-profit colleges. Tell them to look at what we do, not what we say, because there is a difference. If I'm not sitting here, you don't know what happens in this agency. But because I'm committed, because the president and the vice president are committed, it makes a difference. Don't ever believe that your vote doesn't count, because once you start doing that, then you've basically said, I'm going to take whatever you give me. I'm going to accept whatever you do. Fight for yourself. I mean, who doesn't fight for themselves? Mm -hmm. Ms. Forge, I have to respectfully uh, disagree with one thing you said. You said that, uh, you know, don't look at what we do. Look at, you know, don't look at what we say. Look at what we do. What we do. Or when they campaign, they tell us all of these different things. So when you talk about criminal justice reform, voting rights, Build Back Better, George Floyd Policing Act, you know, if if we haven't seen any advancement made on those issues. But but now we have done uh, an order on chokeholds. We've on a done federal it. level. Right. It I mean, but federal, that's all we can police, do. Yeah, federal police, not out, they didn't kill George Floyd. I know. Or Eric but, but But I do say this. Maybe everything that has been promised has not come to fruition, but we still have three more years. That's the first thing. Secondly, the one thing I'll say about the president, his head and his heart are in the right place. There are some things he can do and some things he cannot do. But we are working every day to make sure that we address all the issues that he promised. And I think that we will get there. We won't get it all because we can't do it all on our own. We have to deal with Congress. We have to deal with the Senate. We have to deal with mayors and governors. But we will make most of those promises real. I have that much confidence and faith that we will. Are you afraid of what could happen in the midterms? Of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, because as a general rule, people kind of take the midterms off. That's the first thing. Secondly... Historically, the party it, that of the president generally loses, at least on a federal level, the House. Uh, but more importantly, it goes back to what you said. People aren't feeling good. Mm-hmm. And when people don't feel good about themselves, they want change. Sometimes we don't give things long enough to work. We want instant change. Mm-hmm. And that's just not what the federal government it is. It's like turning around an ocean liner. And it takes time. You don't get change immediately. And so when people don't feel good, we don't make good choices. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you, um, we talk about our people, and a lot of times we're behind because we've never learned, right? Mm-hmm. My parents didn't know how. My parents never went to college. I was the first person to go to college in my family. 
uh, and graduate. My parents didn't know about stocks and bonds. They just didn't know. They didn't know about house buying. They're still in the same house that they, they bought 44 years ago. How do we teach our community? Do we have programs that's going to teach our community how to purchase a home, the best way to build a home, you know, how to get these programs that you're talking about? Because a lot of these things we don't know, we, we have no idea about. We fund agencies all over the country to do education. We actually do it on our own website. We have $20 million in the field right now just to do education on home buying. It's just a matter of going to our website, looking at it, and finding out where you can get that information. We're trying to make it as simple as we possibly can, but we have to do a little more. And so we are working on trying to make sure that we can get the information out. But but the information is there. You need a marketing plan. Yeah, Democrats need a marketing <laughs> plan, period. Democrats are terrible at messaging, Ms. Ford. <laughs> like, horrible. I don't disagree. So what can be done? Like, y'all got to hire Nike or something? Like, what is, hire Nike. like I'm serious. Hire Kanye, I don't know. Like, who do you hire to, to help y'all get this messaging out here? Reach out to the Kardashians. Kardashians can help <laughs> get stuff out there. Do you do you ever get frustrated, you know, when you see one or two people, the Joe Manchin, the Kirsten Cinemas of the world, blocking this agenda? This oh, agenda sure. that we know will benefit black people greatly. Why do they have so much power to do that? Well, in this environment, almost every senator has that much power if they, t if they decide to use it. They all have it. We have 50, 50 votes. So anyone, Democrat, it doesn't have to be them, anyone. Can cross the line. Well, I, and I'm disappointed, yes. Mm -hmm. But I would say that if you look at the number of judges that we've already gotten through, if you look at the number of black women that have already gotten through the, the confirmation process, if you look at the fact Sorry. that I and many others have gone through the confirmation process. It was because they voted for us. Mm -hmm. So there are some issues. I mean, you, you know the old saying, there are no permanent friends and no permanent enemies, just In permanent business. interests. That's right. And so that's the same thing. And so there are some things they are really good on. And I think ultimately we're going to find a place where both of them can support what we bring forward with uh, Build Back Better, with voting rights. It may not be what we want, but I do believe that we will make progress. But you have to understand how that Im impacts, you know, voters who voted Democrat. I agree. When they see two Democrats blocking these agendas, whether it's voting rights, whether it's the George Floyd Policing Act, like these are things that people actually, these big tentpole items people went out there and actually voted for, getting blocked by Democrats. Right. But I would also say that it's also blocked by 50 Republicans. We yeah. expect them to, though. No, we don't expect them to. You know, I, I, I just don't believe that we give them a pass. pass we are right. talking about the oh, democracy of this country. Mm -hmm. I expect them white people to do that. I also that. felt like Democrats <laughs> in, in West Virginia are probably different than Democrats Very. in other places. 72% of the, the people in West Virginia believe that Manchin is doing the right thing. Yeah, they, that, that's his base. So we got to pick up seats other places. We do. And that's why you have to vote. You and gotta, I think you gotta and run, they wouldn't rely on you, two people. You, but you got to run blocking. the right people, though, because if mm -hmm. somebody like President Biden or Vice President Harris, if they go out there and they stomp for the mansions of the world and the cinemas of the world, they're co-signing them. So you're telling me that's who I need to vote for. So if, I, if, if people vote for them and then they get into the Senate and they block agendas, then what? Well, but we, we stomp for a whole lot of other people, too. And so um, just think about it right now. Right now we've got um, people all over the country who are running for Senate. I think you're right. We have to make the right choices, whatever those may be. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, we, as voters, need to take the initiative to go out and vote. Because I'm going to tell you, if we vote, we win. And Georgia is a perfect example. You know, I mean, in other communities, I am a person that just believes that you vote for the best candidate, whoever that is. Right. And I think all of us need to think about it that way. So I'm gonna ask this question again. Simple. Why would it, why should black people vote for Democrats this election cycle, when nothing has been done to advance some of the most important issues to our community? But see, I disagree that we haven't advanced important issues. I disagree with that premise. Um, for the last year and a half, or almost two years, we have made sure that every homeowner could stay in their home. We've made sure that people didn't get evicted. We've made sure that we have reduced child poverty, especially in black communities, by more than thirty percent. We put $5 billion into HBCUs, and I could go on. Mm -hmm. It's not that we've done nothing. Right. We have done things. And so I don't, I don't think that it's fair. I don't think it's a fair assessment to say that we've not done anything. We've done a lot. It's been one year. we still got three years left. Thank you. Yeah, and we've done a lot. I agree, but there, there's, a, there's a sense of urgency they always put on voters, and it's always vote like democracy depends on it, and the, the democracy is at stake, but I don't see, us, I don't see them governing like that. 
Well, there is an urgency, and I don't disagree with that. But we still work in an environment that is a bureaucracy. And so as much as we try to move it faster, it still takes time. But I do know that we all believe that there's an urgency. And that's why. Time is of the essence. It's January. It, it is. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen. I think, well, you'll see, I think that, that things will become clearer in terms of what the administration has done sooner than you think. I think it just, it takes time. People are so busy doing things, they forget to tell you what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a problem with, with most administrations. They're so busy trying to get it done that they don't stop to let you know they did it. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting better. I, but I don't disagree with you at all. Mm -hmm. I think that we do need to have some urgency. And we do need to say to people what's going on. And we do need to help people. I, I don't disagree. What, what does the House America effort entail? Well, what it entails is we are asking for communities to commit to give us a number, whether it be 1,000 new housing units for homeless or 2,000, whatever the number is, we're, we're, we're tallying them because our goal right now is to do 20,000 units of homelessness by the end of this year, just this year. But we're getting more because more and more communities are signing on. So we've mm -hmm. got about, as I said, 70 communities that have signed on, and they are making commit commitments to us to make sure that they can get so many off the streets in their communities. And that's what it really is, is to promise us, mm -hmm. to go out and be intentional, to look at it and say, we've got a housing problem. This is how this city, uh, Charlotte or, or whatever city, this is, this is how we're going to handle it. Right. And we make a commitment to you that you can take this 10,000 houses off your list because we got it. That's basically what it is. Mm. You know, another campaign promise, the student debt. Should President Biden cancel student debt like many in Congress are asking him to do and how regular people are asking him to do? Well, I think that the president said that if the Congress sends him a bill, he'll do it. And I think he should if they send it. I mean, I, I just think that there are just some things that um, we want to happen. But mind you, I'm going to go back again. We have erased student debt for 630 thousand people. But he made a promise with what 10,000 10,000 for every student. Yes. That was in debt. Yeah. And that just kind of went away. Well, it didn't go away. His philosophy is that Congress has to send him the legislation, and if they do, he will sign it. Mm -hmm. That's always been his position. I don't know that it's changed. Mm -hmm. So how do people push on those issues? And now that's the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the good question. Mm -hmm. You call your Congress people. Mm -hmm. You call your senators. You call your Congress people and tell them we want this legislation. One thing about elected officials, we all answer to the people, yeah. especially in an election year. What's your cell phone number? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you my cell phone number. I'm not going to put it on here, but I'm going to give it to you. Before I leave this room, I'm going to give you my cell phone I'm number. Also, as don't forget, you got to give us the information so people can get I will make sure that we Give do. us that information. I will so make sure we people. do. I do have one more question. Do you believe that black people are old? reparations and that government programs designed to restore what was lost could be a part of some type of reparations package? I think it depends on what you mean by reparations. Do I think black people are owed some kind of compensation of, in some way, shape, or form? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, though. I don't know if it's 40 acres and a mule. I don't know if it's a check. I don't know what that is. But do I believe that we should be compensated? for our labor to build this country, mm -hmm. you know, our, our slave labor, our prison labor, you know, our military labor. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Well, Marsha Fudge, we thank you for coming and thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been Hopefully my pleasure. Be back. Yes, come my back, pleasure. please. Because, I mean, pleasure. seriously, somebody has to message what's happening and what's going on mm -hmm. to, the, to the people because, Absolutely. like we said, Democrats are terrible. And people need to know about resources available to them. I think that's one of the most important takeaways, too. And there are a lot more than people know. Mm -hmm. And what's We're the hotline number or the TikTok page? <laughs> something that people can reach out to. Uh, you can just go to HUD.gov, but, but okay. I'll make sure that I give you Please. I'm going to give you and you and you my cell phone. Okay. <laughs> so y'all can call me. I'll tell you, I'm the face. Uh -huh. I'll take it. You She's know. like, I'm not in Congress anymore. But Thank you. <laughs> All right, it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. <laughs>